Good morning. This is Jimmy. It's Saturday morning. We had a real good time the last couple of nights at uh, Ava First Southern Baptist Church. I was just playing a fiddle some and singing. <clears throat> My voice is still very weak. They were very kind to me. I did not sing very well at all. So I tried to make up for it and play it, but you know, I can only play so good. <laughs> Certainly not what it was when I was in my prime. But the people enjoyed it, and they worshipped, and they sang, and uh, it was a good service. Um, we start tonight in Pulaski County. Uh, first, a, a dinner at the camp, and then song fest tonight at uh, 6.30, I think, at uh, uh, First Baptist Church of St. Robert. If you're in the area, please come. Tomorrow, I think I'm at uh, Sunday. The churches I think I'm going to be at are Pisgah in the morning and Gasconade with Ron Adrian at 4 o'clock and then back to Pisgah again at 6 in the evening. The session's Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I'll be preaching in the morning session on Monday. There's a morning session and uh, and an evening session with the afternoon off there at First Baptist St. Robert. Be sure and come. Come for the morning service and stay for lunch. Uh, same thing on Tuesday. I'll be preaching Monday and Tuesday mornings and uh, also Tuesday night. And and there will be a lot of musicians there. There'll be a lot of singing, a lot of music, and I'm going to play and sing some too. And we will pray that my voice is stronger. It's certainly better than it was Monday because it kind of stripped out on me Sunday. I had an unfortunate incident where the microphone went out or whatever. And I just had to scream the song so everybody could hear me. They're like Rudy Valley or Tiny Tim or something, you know, like, Jesus, Jesus. You know, you have to throw your voice way back there. You know, they used to make a phone in those days. <clears throat> and all the records they made, <laughs> all the records they made, they had to almost scream. They sang real loud so that it would come out clear because it cut through a sound cone and it cut directly into a vinyl record. That's how they recorded the early records. So, <clears throat> the loud singers were the ones who ruled the day. Yeah, like in uh, when I was a kid, it was the loud preachers that ruled the day. But with sound technology, you don't have to be loud to be effective. You don't have to scream to be effective. Although sometimes it helps excite the people in front of you. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're in Jeremiah chapter 32. And... Uh, if I get confused sometime, I'm, I've made a decision to use on a daily basis this nice Bible that Brother Ed Held gave me. And so, anyway, chapter 32 of the book of Jeremiah, we got up through Hannah, Hannah Mill coming uh, to buy, uh, to sell Jeremiah a field of land that belonged to him and his family. And, and I explained that Jeremiah had the right as kinsman redeemer as to keep the land, keep the possession in the family. And so beginning in verse 32, I mean, chapter 32, verse one, we'll just, just do a little update here. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army was seized Jerusalem and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king's of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, the king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hands of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. This was the prophecy that Jeremiah made that got him thrown in jail. God gave 
Zedekiah and the court and actually anybody within the walls of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar surrounded the city in 589 B.C. Completely surrounded it, cut it off. Because Zedekiah was rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and would not pay the tribute. And he forgot that he was a puppet king because he had an alliance with Egypt. Well, now ne Babylon has defeated the Egyptian empire and the remaining army that Pharaoh has is hiding in Egypt and uh, guarding their, their frontiers and just waiting for Nebuchadnezzar to come down, which he won't do until he finishes up at Jerusalem. 589 B.C., the city surrounded. It will fall in 586 B.C. This is this is two years into the siege, a year uh, before Babylon fell, because it's in the 10th year of Zedekiah. Zedekiah reigned 11 years, and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar captured and took J Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So there's a year or less left in the tenth year of his reign, so there's a year, uh, a year or le uh, a year or more. I guess you could say two years or less, because if you'd only been there nine years, well, the next day you're in the tenth year. So it says it's in the tenth year, but uh, the fall of Jerusalem is coming. God gave them a deal through Jeremiah that even after the siege began, Jeremiah said, "Look." If you just go out and surrender to the king of Babylon, you'll save your lives. You'll save the lives of the people. They'll go away captive, but they'll live wherever I shall send them, saith the Lord. Zedekiah wouldn't do it. Even though he knew that Ezekiel, the, the priest, had been hauled away to Babylon, and he was alive because he got letters from him. And Daniel of the royal seed was a eunuch in the house of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he had already been there for seven, eight years. He's a grown man now, but a eunuch. The offer was made to Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, and he was ruling as king. And the king Jeremiah told Jeconiah and his family, said, look, if you just go out and surrender. And they weren't, the city wasn't besieged yet. It's just Nebuchadnezzar sent his army to collect, collect the, uh, the, the bounty and to remove Jeconiah as king. And uh, set Zedekiah, his uncle, on the throne. But Jeconiah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went out with his family, with his wives, with his children, and many of the courts, the nobles, and they went away and they were deported into Jerusalem. And he will live there for at least 30 plus years. And he will have children and his descendants, through his descendants will come Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which is called Christ. That's how the line got passed down from Solomon, from David through Solomon. And then Mary, the bloodline was passed down from David through his son, Nathan. But Zedekiah would not obey the word of the Lord. All Jeremiah told us is, told him the truth. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come here and destroy this place. But if you'll surrender, you can live. Zedekiah wouldn't surrender. So now it's uh, over a year, but less than two years before the fall of Jerusalem. And they're surrounded. And Jeremiah's in jail for the word of the Lord because his prophecy didn't make the king happy. Verse 6, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, mine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, 
by my field, I pray thee, that is at Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of the inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. God told him Hannah Mill was going to come. Hannah Mill came. And I explained to you yesterday how the right of redemption worked and how the person that was nearest in kin to the person offering the sale could buy the land at an agreed upon price and uh, keep it in the family so it wouldn't go to the debtor, uh, to the creditors or to, you know, to somebody else. And I read you several examples where that was put into play. Naboth against Ahab and, and, and Jezebel. And of course, most uh, extensively and, uh, and in a detailed way in the book of Ruth, where Boaz redeemed Naomi and all she had and, and got Ruth as a wife in the process. And uh, oh, by the way, they had a little boy named Obed. Obed had a little boy named Jesse. And Jesse had a little boy that was named David, and he became the king of Israel. What do you think about that? See, God always knows what's going to happen. He says, I declare the end from the beginning. And Jeremiah's talking, he says, and in verse 9, And I bought the field of Hannah Mill, my uncle's son, which it was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it, and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Maasiah, in the sight of Hannah Mill, mine uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Remember, Jeremiah's in jail, but he's not in the dungeon right now. There at the end of his life, he was allowed to sit, I mean, at the end of Jerusalem, before Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, he was able to have some freedom and move about and sit in the court of the prison outside, and people could come and visit him. And that's how he did a lot of his writing and a lot of his preaching. He would dictate, Baruch would write, and go read it to the people or go to the temple and read it or go to the king and read it, whoever Jeremiah sent him to. And uh, now Baruch was scared about that all the time. <laughs> he's afraid he's going to get thrown in jail too. Verse 13, I charged Baruch before them saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open." And put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Now the cynic might say, yeah, they're fixing to be possessed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. But God had Jeremiah buy a piece of his own inheritance back. And remember I told you that they had already taken away his inheritance. They took away his land. They took away his house because of what he was preaching. He was preaching that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and Judah was going to be led away captive. He started preaching that way back when good King Josiah was the king. And he kept preaching it. That's why he wound up in jail. But they took away his land they took away his house they took away his father's inheritance they took away his daddy's job they kicked jeremiah out of the priesthood that's how he made his living he was a priest that's how their family made their living his father was a priest and then it says they took away his beloved it's either his wife or his girlfriend they stole her away and gave her to another man those rotten men in anathoth and this here's one of them Oh, it's Jeremiah's cousin. But Jeremiah buys that piece of ground because God told him to do it. And he says that there will be Jews on this land again someday owning these parcels of land. Good morning, Charlie. Beginning in verse 16. Now, 
this is today's. Now, when I d- delivered Jeremiah, when I had delivered the evidence of the purpose of the purchase under Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed unto the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Praise God, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Remember when Jeremiah says that he was old and Sarah was old. The Lord told him that he was going to have a kid. And the, the Lord said, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. God can do anything. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. To give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day. People still talk about it. Moses brought the plagues upon Egypt. Pharaoh let the children go. Pharaoh chased the children into the wilderness. The Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea, and they went across on dry ground. And then the Egyptians, assailing to go after them, were drowned. Assailing to go after them were drowned. The sea closed on them, and then... The Israelites saw all the bodies and horses and chariots of the Pharaoh cast up upon the river banks, the beach, on the shore, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day and in Israel and among other men and has made thee a name as it is this day. And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs, with wonders, and with a strong hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with great terror. Remember the murder of the firstborn son? That was pretty terrible. But when I see the blood, he says, I will pass, I will pass over you. He, they put the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost and upon the lintel and he says when I see the blood I will pass over you that's what the Passover is all about and it's given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey they came in and possessed it but they obeyed not thy voice he started out this prayer with praise now he's laying blame on not just the people not just his neighbors, but going all the way back to the days of Joshua when he brought them into the land and repenting for his own sins as well. Jeremiah is very much like the prayer that Daniel prayed. And they came in and possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy law. They have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. Therefore thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. Behold the mounts, they are come up unto the city to take it. You know, where they build their bulwarks and their, they build towers. And they can push closer and closer and closer until the men can climb over inside. They build banks up against the wall, getting closer and closer and closer so they can bring their artillery and their archers in. Behold the mounts, they are come unto the city to take it. When the Assyrians came to Jerusalem 130 plus years before, 140 years before, when King Hezekiah was the king, the Assyrian general Rabshaki came to the walls and said, Your God ain't going to protect you. Hezekiah is not going to protect you. I am going to make you eat your own dung and drink your own piss. And then I'm going to kill you and take you captive. I'm going to, you're going to have to surrender. I'm going to take this city. Made God mad. 
And Isaiah went to King Hezekiah and he says, don't worry about it, O king, live forever. Because the Assyrians will not even cast a mount or shoot an arrow against you. And God caused the army to pull away uh, in short order and they went to fight somewhere else. Because the king Sennacherib of Assyria ordered Rabshakeh to pull out his army and go somewhere else. But he said, I'll be back. Yeah. Well, the army of the Assyrians was destroyed. They never did cast him out because God said they won't. Now God says they will, and they have. The city is surrounded. The, the Babylonians are dug in around it. Nobody can go in or out. The city is shut up just as effectively as Jeremiah is shut up in the prison. Behold the mounts there come unto the city to take it, and the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans, as the Babylonians, that fight against it because of the sword and of the famine and of the pestilence. And what thou hast spoken is come to pass. Behold, thou seest it. Remember the original prophecy that God gave Jeremiah? He said that he was going to take, he was going to destroy this place. He was going to destroy Jerusalem. He was going to destroy Judah. And he says that what the famine doesn't get, the pestilence will get. And he was in a big, they were in a big drought when God started telling them this. What the drought doesn't get, the pestilence will get. Who the pestilence doesn't get, the sword will get. And whom the sword doesn't get, we'll, we'll, we'll take them into captivity. Now Jeremiah is saying, well, looky here, it's all come to pass, just like you said, O oh Lord. It's always good when God has told you things and shown you things to tell him, you were right, Lord. This is how it turned out. It's just like you said it would be. Because you remember that you weren't so smart that you knew what was going to happen. It was he that showed you what was going to happen. It was he that showed you what to do. It was the Lord who guided your step. It was God who put his words in your mouth and his thoughts in your mind and his love in your heart. It's God who did those things, not we ourselves. Jeremiah made the prophecy, but he got the prophecy from God. The prophecy turned out right. Therefore, God gets the glory. Jeremiah is saying, I don't like the way it is. We're surrounded by the Chaldeans and you know, sooner or later the city will fall, but it's just like you said it would be, Lord. One good way to praise and worship God is to tell him how right he is. You see, that is the definition of righteousness. The very definition of righteousness is that you do the right thing. What God like I might do some things that are righteous, that are good, that are the right thing, but I'm not righteous in myself. Isaiah tells me that my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They can't do me any good. My own works can't give me into heaven because by the flesh shall, uh, <clears throat> by the works of the law shall no, <clears throat> excuse me, shall no flesh be justified. In other words, we can't stand in traditions and works and laws. We have to stand in Christ alone. We have to stand by the blood that he shed on Calvary. Our faith is in him and him crucified. But thanking God for being faithful and being righteous. See, I might do a right thing, but I'm never righteous. God is righteous by definition because he always does the right thing. He never does anything wrong. Jimmy might do some righteous things, but Jimmy is not righteous because Jimmy can and does wrong and has done wrong and will do wrong. That's just the nature of the flesh. He starts out this prayer 
by reminding, praising him and reminding him that he made everything, that he delivered Israel, that he brought him into the promised land. Then he goes into repentance. He's repenting for the sins of both himself and Israel. Then he starts telling God, the prophecies you gave me, the things that you had me preach to Judah, they are all coming true. Everything is happening just like you said it would, Lord. Verse 25, and thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thee the field for money and take witnesses for this city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Jeremiah obeyed. He bought the field, a parcel of land from his cousin, Hannah Mill, his uncle's son. Sir, what was his name? I done forgot his name. Uh, the son of Shalom, his uncle. If you remember, Shalom was one of the wealthy men who helped Jeremiah out of time or two and helped get him out of out of jail and helped get him out of trouble. On one occasion, uh, uh, encouraged the princes and the lords of the king that were in the king's court to not put Jeremiah into jail. God is going to answer Jeremiah, and that's where we'll pick up next time. We have to remember that the prophet doesn't always understand what he's prophesying. And I think part of this, even though Jeremiah preached the word faithfully, and gave the messages to the king, to the people, to the court, to the priest, to the false prophets, whoever, uh, whoever God directed Jeremiah to give these messages. He was always faithful. And he might not have known exactly what was going on with every detail of every prophecy he made. He just delivered the word faithfully. And you know, you as a preacher, you can do that right now. You can deliver the word faithfully. He still is humble in his respect. He never doubted, but he's always amazed by the power of God. He doesn't doubt the power of God, but he's always amazed by it. You know, he says, he says nothing is too hard for the Lord. He just said that a minute ago. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And so, when we're amazed that nothing's too hard for him, that means that we're just overwhelmed again by how great God is and how weak we are, how mighty God is, how small we are, how big he is. You know, I find a lot of trouble in the world today among Christians. They might have a high view of God, but they have too high view of themselves. We start putting things in perspective. And you know that it's working and you know that you're applying the word to yourself where God in your mind, God keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. God starts becoming a bigger deal and you start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He must increase, but I must decrease. You see, when you have a high view of God, you'll have a low view of yourself. If you have a low view of yourself, you won't necessarily have a high view of God, but it's a good place to start. Because it is God who puts every breath in your lungs. It's God who provides every morsel of food for your belly. It's God who gives you health. It's God who gives you years. It's God who gives you everything you need. I read a sign the other day on Facebook. I think you call them a meme or whatever it is. 
and it says that our survival depends on a thin layer of topsoil and rain. And that's true. Because it affects everything from the balance of oxygen and CO2 on the earth to the food we put in our belly. Even if you'd never eat a vegetable, the cows do, and you eat the cow. Does that make you a vegetarian? If cows eat grass and I eat the cow, then I am therefore a vegetarian. I'm not sure it works that way. But I also know that I'll feel pretty good after I eat a good steak. <clears throat> I usually only eat a good steak when somebody else is buying. It's not that I'm cheap. I'm just frugal with the Lord's money. My wife sometimes says I'm cheap. I prefer the word frugal. <clears throat> <laughs> Charlie's been out to eat with me, you know. I usually go places where I can get free food. Uh, you know, it's like if you have a card that should be played, you need to play it. <laughs> because I'm, I'm too ugly to get by on my looks and... <laughs> I'm too wore out to get by on my talent, so I have to I have to get by on the charitable actions of my friends. <laughs> I love the Lord. The Lord has provided every job I ever had, every dollar I ever made, whether I earned it as a wage or it was given to me as a love offering. The God has provided it all. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fear of Isaac. The consolation of Israel. The root of Jesse. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's all Jeremiah's doing here. Lord, you did everything. You made everything there is. Lord, you delivered us out of slavery. Lord, you brought us into a big land, a far place, a wide place full of milk and honey. Lord, our sin brought us down to this point. Now you're destroying us and taking us into captivity. But you're the great God and everything you said has come to pass. And we know from some of Jeremiah's discussions with the Lord, like in chapter 17, chapter 20, that, that Jeremiah is not very pleased with some of the things that are going on. He's not very comfortable with the things that are going on. But he acknowledges that God is always right. He says, Lord, the things you told me to preach, they all turned out to be true. Did Jeremiah doubt they'd be true? No. <laughs> but he's still amazed. That is the mark of a humble heart, friend. When you know that God is going to be God and you're still amazed and excited and grateful when he does. If you ever wake up one morning and you're not grateful anymore, repent because uh, you think it a little too much of yourself because the opposite of gratitude is uh, self. So you can't think of yourself and God at the same time. Can't hold those two ideas. Because either he's God or you're God. Well, we know who's God. I love you all. Talk to you later. <laughs>